Fernando reached deep into the hole, every muscle and sinew stretched to breaking point. Fisting Mother Nature would come at a cost, a cost that Fernando was willing to pay if it meant that Rebecca would come back to him. After a lot of grunting and straining, a glistening Fernando clenched his teeth and pulled out an erogenous gooey orb from the tight hole. As he inspected it, he imagined gifting this gooey orb to his sweet, sweet Rebecca as the now forgotten, prolapsed hole trembled, limp and quivering. I must keep it safe, Fernando whispered to himself, slipping his prize into the snug confines of his shorts. The orb nestled pleasantly against Fernando's male anatomy as he pondered his next choice. Dare he use the orb in an attempt to reunite with Rebecca? Or should he pawn it off for enough crack and yogurt to forget ever meeting her? Before he could decide, Fernando felt a sharp pain run up his urethra as the orb entered him. He could feel an incredible power welling up inside. His feet left the ground. Fernando slowly and passionately ran to Gooseman for his advice, for he knows of many things, such as how to milk a goat properly. Finally arriving at his destination, his hand firmly grasping the door handle, Fernando remembered a warning Gooseman had given him years ago. Fernando, if you ever burst in here floating inches off the ground with a glowing crotch seeking my advice again, I will be forced to rent you out to the North Koreans for one of their methamphetamine socials. Just then, the door swung open to reveal Gooseman, looking even drunker and surlier than usual. Various high-ranking North Korean party officials could be seen frolicking energetically behind him in various states of undress. Fernando knew his fate was sealed. Gooseman, however, was too drunk to remember his previous warning and promptly puked on the ground. The vomit pooled nicely on the part of the porch where Fernando's feet should have been. As the light from Fernando's glowing crotch glinted aggressively off Gooseman's aviators, his lips curled into a menacing smile. Ah, Fernando, he said. We were just talking about you. It's not what you think, said Fernando, but it was too late for excuses. Gooseman gripped Fernando's ankle and pulled him into the fusty house, yelling Korean insults even he didn't understand. A table was laid out at the other end of the room, festooned with crowbars and tire irons with which the Koreans were arming themselves. If only I had my squid hunting harpoon, thought Fernando. That instant he felt immense heat as his shiny crotch produced a razor sharp harpoon. Fernando gripped the staff. It's squidding time, he said. With the passion of 1,000 chimps, Fernando swung the harpoon in any direction he could. Fernando, no! Those are my best and only customers, shrieked Gooseman from a safe distance. Even in the whirlwind of his passion, part of Fernando's mind remained detached. When this is over, he thought, I'm going to need, like, a whole factory full of yogurt to soothe my jangled nerves. Sudden, intense heat engulfed him, and a stout industrial factory pipe emerged from his loins. A torrent of pressurized yogurt splooged from the pipe, engulfing the remaining party officials. What have you done to my carpet, you maniac? Gooseman screamed. Fernando glared at him. Hopefully this will be the last time you sell me to a group of speed freaks. We'll see, said Gooseman. Fernando turned his back on his friend and hovered slowly towards the door. He would find no help here. With great relief, Fernando emerged into the sunlight. Rebecca was waiting for him. Fernando, it is I, Rebecca, said Rebecca. Yes, Rebecca, I know you, said Fernando. We dated for three months. She smiled sweetly. Ah, Fernando, it was that very ability to recall events which occurred continuously over the course of 90 days or less that first brought us together. Fernando's mind drifted to his and Rebecca's torrid three-month love affair, but the only thing he could recall was the fist of love they had shared over a tense weekend at her mother's house. As Fernando approached Rebecca, he noticed something weird. She was not wearing the cowboy hat she had worn at all times since she was four. I've got you, imposter, Fernando said, and hurled his harpoon with all his strength. Rebecca dodged it easily. Her eyes glistening like fresh yogurt, she said, You have changed, Fernando. The orb has corrupted you. We must rid your urethra of its poisonous presence. Confused and deflated, Fernando's yogurt pipe retracted back into his body, and he obediently followed Rebecca as she led him to a mysterious unmarked hot pink minivan. The minivan's interior was covered in fuzzy synthetic fur. A table stood in the center, upon which rested two bowls and a tub of Fernando's favorite grape yogurt. 
Rebecca began to stuff her face with the lovely sticky substance. The sight of the yogurt slowly dripping from her mouth ignited Fernando's lust, like maybe only 20 other things in the universe could. Gooseman staggered onto his porch through the open front door, his footsteps heralded by a yogurty squelching. He looked at the drama unfolding on his front lawn and saw the thing masquerading as Fernando's lovely Rebecca as it really was. Seeing Fernando seat himself at the table inside the manifold rape van, which had undertaken its great journey through the totality of space and time, Gooseman recognized the certain peril that Fernando faced. With every fiber of his being, Gooseman bellowed, That's a $50 surcharge, you ugly bitch! Fernando's gaze stretched before him, but Rebecca's yogurty lips remained the sole focus of his attention. His grasp on his surroundings slipped warmly away into a screwed vortex of light and fur. All inhibitions left him as the animal caress of each swishing hair washed up from his knees and over his plummeting body. The image of his beloved softened and quivered but for the piercing pools of her facial openings. Tender ports into realms of tight, welcoming, unending tunnels of slippery nightmares. The coarse meadow of hairs turned to thick, stubby, fleshly udders that licked a mess of indescribable fluids and smells across the body. But Fernando no longer had fingers or toes. His body was no more a manly machine of hair and musk. Fernando was a melon in space. He was an open fridge in an empty house. He was a moan in a vacuum. A fraction of a second before Fernando's consciousness was snuffed out forever, a deep, masculine voice moaned loudly. Fernando, you must wake up! The words shocked him like a heroin rush. Meanwhile, Gooseman decided to take a little nap on the lawn. The voice continued. You have been trapped in this same story, this same reality for three million years. In a few moments, Gooseman will choke to death on his own vomit. Rebecca will transform into a giant creature with a vertical mouth and a great appetite for human flesh. Then you will be devoured in just one bite and the story will reset. If you don't wake up right now, this will continue forever, defying the laws of space and time. The culprit is none other than Waira Wanui, the old Incan demon that your family clan fought for generations, maintaining the balance of light and shadows in this dimension. You are the chosen one, Fernando. The Waira Wanui is afraid of you. That's why he trapped you in this whore prison. The orb is the key, Fernando. Use it and finish this story once and for all. His conscious self restored, Fernando desperately tried to think of a weapon that would work in the close confines of the minivan. A knife would have been the most obvious choice, but instead Fernando's feverish brain settled on a device he closely associated with Rebecca due to their shared history. The fist of love materialized in midair and magically strapped itself onto Fernando's waiting hand. The resulting battle was fierce but rather short. Even a trans-dimensional shapeshifter is no match for a seasoned man -whore armed with a love fist in close confines. The infernal spawn of Wairawanui tried to recoil back into the awful mind which had given it birth. Wairawanui let out a cry of pain that echoed through the cosmos. Millions of years, not to mention light years, later, Wairawanui's agonized scream was recorded, less heard than seen, on a world not unlike Fernando's own, where it was mistaken for a burst of gamma rays. The synthetic fur spasmed and began to contract, as the manifold rape van, sensing the demise of its owner, prepared to collapse into a singularity. With the last of his strength, Fernando kicked off the far wall. He felt the edge of the van brush against the filthy soles of his feet as it sucked itself inwards with the power of several suns. Fernando turned the comatose gooseman on his side so he wouldn't choke on his own vomit. Three days later, Fernando passed the orb while urinating, which was easily the most painful experience of his life. He hid the orb in his toy box. Fernando knew that Waira Winui had been wounded but not killed, and that he might one day need the orb again. 